Hello cyborgs and welcome to deep dive number nine. In this deep dive we'll be tackling the enormous, world-renowned, wildly overplayed song Hallelujah by Mr. Leonard Cohen. This is not to be confused with the Happy Mondays Hallelujah, nor the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. No siree Bob. I like to refer to this song as the little song that could, because in 1984, CBS Records had so little faith in the song that they refused to release it. Yet now, in 2020, there are 300 known versions of this song in existence. It's a song that was written in a hotel in New York 37 years ago, and just last week, it was sung on an Italian balcony during a pandemic, and the video has accrued over 1 million views. This song has an incredible story behind it. As you might expect, I like tackling songs with interesting backstories, and Hallelujah is no exception. This isn't your typical top 40 hit that was released and went straight to the top of the charts. In fact, the song was largely unknown until over a decade after its release. It's steadily grown in popularity, and now it's seen as somewhat of a modern, secular hymn for the ages. Be sure to stick around to the end, when I'll hook you guys up with some dank Hallelujah memes. Hopefully God won't smite me for being so <clears throat> sacrilegious. So grab your snorkel, hit subscribe, ding that bell, and strap yourself in. 1984, the year of Purple Rain and Michael Jackson's thriller, Soviet Union boycotted the Summer Olympics. Leonard Cohen's career had hit a low point. Nobody was talking about him. His 1977 album, Death of a Ladies Man, was a collaboration with Phil Spector, and it was not well received. It was a commercial and critical flop. His other album, Recent Songs, which featured Jennifer Warrens, was also a flop. So he was low. He was in a bad place. He ended his five-year hiatus from writing. In 2001, he told Sylvie Simmons that he spent most of the time between 1979 and 1984 in the south of France with his children. Family time. These years, however, weren't entirely barren. In fact, in 83, he wrote and starred in the made-for-TV musical, I Am a Hotel, which featured several songs in his narration. The storyline to this short film features all sorts of romantic liaisons in King Edward Hotel in Toronto. Cohen features frequently as an amused bystander. The film also features my personal favorite song of Cohen's, Suzanne. Fast forward to 1984. According to Anthony Reynolds' 2010 memoir, Leonard Cohen, A Remarkable Life, Leonard Cohen was holed up in his Royalton Hotel on 44th Street in New York, where he wrote Hallelujah. Rumor has it one writing session ended up with him sitting in his underwear, banging his head on the floor. That head-bashing Canadian, Leonard Cohen, was renowned for the copious amount of material he would write, and this song was no exception. In fact, he wrote 80 draft verses of this song. I kid you not. In any case, the Royalton was also where he met with producer John Lesauer. They met at the hotel so Cohen could play him his new songs. He played them on a Cassia. Lesauer graduated from Yale. He and Cohen had worked together in the 1974 album. Strangely, they hadn't spoken for 10 years. It's kind of weird, isn't it? But then again, maybe it's not weird. Maybe I'm just being judgmental. Maybe sometimes people just don't talk because they get busy. I don't think they had anything against each other. I mean, come on. Come on. However, when they met up, John noticed something different. Leonard's voice had deepened. It dropped a minor third. Cohen himself was surprised by this vocal change. This was the beginning of a new phase in Cohen's career. New composing style, new sound, new voice. So a 50-year-old Leonard Cohen recorded various positions at Quadrasonic Sound in New York City in the summer of 83. Bear in mind, this was the same year that Michael Jackson and Madonna were bursting onto the scene. Who the fuck was Leonard Cohen? Nobody. He was a fucking nobody. An old fuddy-duddy put out to pasture. The little group of musicians who refer to themselves as Slow Train took the Slow Train from Tulsa to New York. Sid McGuinness, who played with the band at Late Night with David Letterman and stayed with the show ever since, provided guitar parts. Jennifer Warrens had an even bigger role on this album than his previous effort with her recent songs. I don't mean to sound rude, but her voice provided a counterpoint to the limited parameters of Cohen's voice. And Jenny Thomas also sang on the album. She was from Hawaii and ended up becoming Cohen's longtime companion. He produced an album of her singing his songs in 2006 entitled Blue Alert. The bass was synthesizer bass, as Les Sauer felt that a real bass would conflict with the timbre of Cohen's voice. The choir was several small groups of singers recorded separately. Les Sauer stated that he didn't want key changes or a massive choir. He wanted a feeling of humility to bleed through. According to the Rolling Stone, Lasauer had a blast working with Cohen. I've never had a more rewarding experience, he said. Leonard and I got along so well, it was scary. There were no roadblocks, no disasters. It was great start to finish. 
It was high art. It was just thrilling. Big words. Leanne Ungar, the sound engineer, said that in fact Cohen was quite pragmatic in the studio. He pared down the 80 verses to four after deciding how much he wanted to foreground the religious elements of the song. It had references to the Bible in it, although those references became more and more remote as the song went from beginning to end, he said. Finally, I understood that it was not necessary to refer to the Bible anymore, and I rewrote the song. This is the secular hallelujah. The original version of the song is 6-8 time, evoking both waltz and gospel. It's kind of fitting that it evokes gospel, considering, you know, the title of the song. Sticking with the gospel theme, the song contained several biblical references, such as Samson and Delilah from the Book of Judges, She Cut Your Hair, and adulterous King David and Bathsheba, You Saw Her Bathing in the Roof, Her Beauty in the Moonlight Overthrew You. The meaning of Hallelujah as it exists in the Leonard Cohen version is both non-transparent and transparent. The song definitely comes across like a prayer of sorts. Hallelujah means to praise joyously, and Ya is a shortened verb of the unuttered name of God. So the word Hallelujah is an instruction to the listener to sing tribute to the Lord. However, in the Christian tradition, the word means praise the Lord, and it is not a call to action. So the song starts off with Cohen singing about King David. David is a harp player, and he also heckles God. Cohen follows this up with the line, but you don't really care for music, do you? It's like a slap in the face. This sardonic, flippant comment telling us off, we don't get it, we don't care. And then the narrator explains the song's musical structure. It's in the C major, and the chord progression matches the key of the song. The fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, and the major fifth are, conversely, C, F, G, A minor, F. Polishing the verse off with, the baffled king composes hallelujah, seems to be an absurd commentary on artistic creation itself. King becomes craftsman. The second verse shifts perspective to the second person. It is about David and Bathsheba. Essentially, great men who are called by God are still humans and struggle with sin. David wants to bang this chick who's married, and he does so. He bangs her. He bangs her hard. He really gives it to her all night, relentlessly. Not only that, but he puts a bun in her oven. He fills her up with his royal seed. Trying to cover up what he did, he insists that her husband, Uriah, sleep with her, but Uriah refuses. As a recourse, he gave a note to the army commander to send Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to the front lines to get killed so that she can stay with him. The story of David and Bathsheba is about the abuse of power in the name of lust. David had been a brave and gifted leader, but now began to believe his own propaganda. He did what the critics predicted. He began to take what he wanted. He drank the Kool-Aid. Hey, Kool God created David, but David was weak. He was a king. He loved God, but he was weak and complicated. He's the chosen one. He's righteous and rules Israel as God's servant, yet he's ultimately controlled by his D. He loves S-E-X, but he wants what he can't have. Cohen calls David baffled. I call that an understatement. But even after the drama, the grasping, conniving, sinful King David is still Israel's greatest poet, warrior, and hope. There is so much brokenness in David's life, only God can redeem and reconcile this complicated personality. That is why the baffled and wounded David lifts up to God a painful hallelujah. Following the David and Bathsheba reference, the sexuality of the lyrics is drawn further forward and then reinforced in an image of torture and lust taken from the story of Samson and Delilah. She tied you to a kitchen chair. She broke your throne. She cut your hair. Before resolving with a vision of sexual release, and from your lips she drew the hallelujah. Both biblical heroes are brought down to earth and risk surrendering their authority because of the allure of forbidden love. Even for larger-than-life figures and leaders of nations, the greatest physical pleasure can lead to disaster. So both these dudes are pretty messed up. They're both poets, both womanizers, both adulterers, and both seek God's forgiveness after their transgressions. Both stories are basically about powerful men who lose their power and their promising lives crumble into the dust. In the third verse, Cohen disputes the religious challenge of the first two verses. You say I took the name in vain, he sings. I don't even know the name. There's a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter what you heard, the holy or the broken, hallelujah. Not only the word of God is full of light, but every word is full of light according to Cohen, further underlining the secular approach to the song's theme. The fourth verse takes us to the song's logical conclusion beginning with an admittance. I did my best. It wasn't much. Cohen is only one middle-aged guy trying to make ends meet. I've told the truth. I didn't come to fool you. 
This world is full of conflicts and full of things that cannot be reconciled, Cohen has said, but there are moments when we can transcend the dualistic system and reconcile and embrace the whole mess, and that's what I mean by hallelujah. The one moment that you can live here comfortably in these absolutely irreconcilable conflicts is the moment when you embrace it all and you say, look, I don't understand a fucking thing at all. Hallelujah. That's the only moment we can live here fully as human beings. John Lasauer was thrilled when they finished the song and the album. I said, man, we're on top of this. This is really going to do it, John Lasauer told the Rolling Stone. This is going to be the breakthrough. This record is really going to be important. Hallelujah just jumped out at you. Plus, there was a lot of other great stuff on the album. And it went to Walter Yetkinov, who was the president of CBS Records. And he said, what is this? This isn't pop music. This is a disaster. We're not releasing this. As Cohen recounted the story, when Yetkinov told him that he was rejecting various positions, he said, Leonard, we know you're great, but we just don't know if you're any good. The problem is that the Columbia label execs didn't hear Hallelujah, the first song on side two of various positions, as anything special. They, quite frankly, didn't care for the album. They didn't want to release it. It wasn't pop enough to appeal to the kids. The singer was over the hill. It was a curious song full of Bible references. They released it, but they didn't want to. It came out in Europe in 84 and America in 85. And it didn't hit the charts. In fact, nothing happened. Until Bob Dylan started playing the song during his shows in 1988. That's right, THE Bob Dylan, Mr. Blown in the Wind. Three years after that, in 1999, John Cale from Velvet Underground was approached by the French magazine Une Rock Coutible. They asked him to contribute to I'm Your Fan, which was a sort of odd tribute to Leonard Cohen. He called up Cohen and asked for the verses. Cohen sent him 15 verses. So he picked and chose his favorites and recorded it. This was the first ever cover of the song. Ten years later, this version was used in Shrek, so in 2001, 17 years after its recording, Hallelujah finally hit the big time. Jeff Buckley provided a more sorrowful version a few years later on his album Grace. Sadly, he passed away a few years after that before the song really took off. In 2001, his version of Hallelujah was released and now it's listed at 215 in Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time. Rolling Stone claims that Buckley's version is exquisitely sung. Cohen, however, murmured his song like a dirge. Buckley's version reached number 7 in Norway. It was in the top three in the Swedish charts. As I said, within about a decade, the song has accrued 300 known recorded versions. At this point, the song is beyond just being a song. It's a universal hymn. It's a mantra. It's, it's a prayer of sorts. The 80s was an awful period for real artistic singer-songwriters. The 70s had everything from Paul Simon's solo stuff, James Taylor, Joni, even Randy Newman. But the 80s was all bands and MTV, and yet Knopf might actually have been looking for a way to weed out the Leonards of the world. Lasauer never worked with Cohen again, and this experience was so disappointing that he began making music for films and stopped making albums. He didn't talk to Cohen for another 15 years. He felt bad. He felt like he made a bad record and essentially ruined Cohen's career. Little did he know that Hallelujah would become the most successful song of Leonard Cohen's career, just as the record label also was not aware of this. Ah, if only they had a crystal ball. And now's the time for some dank Hallelujah memes. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next Friday for the next Deep Dive. If you have a song that you would like me to cover in one of my Deep Dives, be sure to leave it in the comments. And uh, the best thing you can do is to share this video, because sharing is caring, while the truck is. If you like Cohen, give this video a thumbs up, and if you don't like Cohen, give it a thumbs down. But let's face it, how could anyone not like Leonard Cohen? Human extinction, plastic water, so
this is a doom blood.